Welcome back. I am excited to introduce our next guest. Erica Ginsberg has an amazing background as a media maker, a filmmaker, a documentarian, a nonprofit professional consultant. And now she has a new book called Creative Resilience. And I'm excited to hear about the book and also excited to hear more from Erica about why it matters, but I have this really strong feeling it matters for all of us. So Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about what got you to here. Sure. Well, I have a dual background. Um, I, all the things you said sound exhausting, but they it are sounds true. like more than dual. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so my background is actually predominantly a, a mix of the arts and international affairs, and I continue to work in sort of both of those fields. And I ended up uh, with a colleague co-founding an organization for documentary filmmakers um, called Docs in Progress, which initially, you know, we were both documentary filmmakers and there's a lot of challenges when you're working independently uh, as a filmmaker. So we wanted to just kind of create a community with others. Um, and so um, I was the founding executive director of that organization, ran it for 10 years. Um, and oh, in that time, uh, between my own work and then just seeing, you know, the joys and challenges that so many in our constituency were facing, I got the idea initially of writing uh, a book that would kind of address uh, some of some of the ups and downs of the creative process. And, uh, you know, the challenge, of course, is that I was very busy, you know, running a nonprofit organization is not easy. And um, so I, you know, it always kind of I had ideas, but they sort of would be notes and they'd go on the back burner and uh, nothing really materialized. And then um, ironically, after I left the organization and then the pandemic started, that really gave me the time and the space to kind of put a lot of those ideas down in writing. And that's led to uh, creative resilience. Wow. Nothing like a good pandemic to give you time to do the stuff you haven't been able to do yet, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, I wouldn't wish the pandemic on anybody. Um, you know, it's it was a trying time. But I think what was interesting about it is I think as people were forced, you know, to stay home and had more time to kind of reflect and, you know, be at home, a lot of people really, you know, either picked up for the first time or resurrected, you know, creative uh, pursuits and finding creative outlets during that time. Um, and so I think, you know, that was one little tiny good thing <laughs> that I think has come out of it. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I think there we're in two camps, right? There's the camp that used the time to really create and take the take advantage and pursue endeavors that they hadn't had time to do, whether it was related to their business or not. You know, some people picked up painting and they had never picked up a brush before. Others were, you know, high on making uh, bread. <laughs> there was a lot of bread baking going on. Although all very different aspects of creativity that maybe as bankers or CPAs, they didn't have the chance to do, although they might have liked to. And that's why, you know, I'm a big believer in a great title. If you gave me a blank book and had a cover on it that said Creative Resilience, I would love to write that book using other people's stories of where they see themselves as creative. I know that you created this within the scope of the creative community. However, my feelings and the reason I'm really excited to have this conversation with you is because I believe each one of us has this creativity in us. We may not have come to it yet, or we came to it whenever we did, um, but there's always a resilience factor built in. So what, what are you seeing now that you've got the book and um, you know it's addressing your your artist community, but I think it's much bigger than that. I agree. And, and even though, you know, the book is about sort of reframing things for artists, I use the word artist very liberally. 
um, because I think that there's a lot of people who, you know, may not call themselves an artist with a capital A, but they're still involved in something that is artistic or something that's creative. You know, I would say inventors, people who are, uh, you know, doing startup businesses. There's a lot of creativity that's involved in that as much as someone who's a painter or a dancer. So what, with the book, you know, while I interviewed a number of people who are, you know, for lack of a better term, professionals, people who get paid uh, to, you know, uh, pursue their arts. Um, I also interviewed amateurs and I love the word amateur. I don't see that as a negative term. I actually have a whole chapter um, about that and about the joy of, of being an amateur artist. Um, and, you know, so I think it was really important because I wanted to write this book, you know, both for people who are already in a community of artists, but also those who, you know, may have things that they're doing as, you know, sort of their side hustle or something they're hoping to do, or even something that they just want to keep as a hobby, but, you know, do it to sort of the best standards possible. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a fairly broad audience that are, it would be interested in the book, um, you know, whether you consider yourself an artist or not. And I would hope after reading the book, everybody reads it would indeed uh, call themselves an artist. I agree. I absolutely agree. I remember um, when I was first called athletic, I never thought of myself as athletic, but I always loved to dance, but I folk danced or I belly danced or I, and I never thought of that as sport. That was just something I love to do. And somebody called me athletic. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> kind of the same thing with artists. Are you art Are you an artist? No, I'm not. But oh my God, look how gorgeous your breads are. Or look how beautifully you've designed the interior of your home. I mean, there are so many what you would call amateur approaches that people don't really recognize. I believe that if you don't express this artistic sensibility that all of us, I believe each of us possesses, I believe it gets stuck. What what did you learn through your stories? Also as a documentary filmmaker, right? So storytelling is the key. So what did you learn through that? Yeah, I mean, I think my background in documentary really helped inform the process because even though this is my first book, I approached it very similarly to how I would think of a documentary. I mean, I had certain ideas that I wanted to convey, but I also had a sense of curiosity. And there were things, you know, that I picked up from people I talked to that might not have occurred to me, or maybe I've had a different experience. And so I really wanted to be able to share those and show sort of the full spectrum of the creative process. Um, you know, I interviewed uh, dancers and musicians and sculptors and painters and writers and just people who were doing very different things or at different points in their life. You know, some people who, you know, are making an entire living uh, from the creative arts, some people who are doing multiple uh, forms of art, people who may have other careers and are doing this on top of that. So I think that, you know, really, I agree with you that, uh, you know, if, if you don't express yourself and you have this sort of inner drive, you know, you can feel very frustrated. And I think even if you are expressing yourself, you can feel very frustrated because trying to balance, you know, the the making of the arts with everything else, you know, whether it's making a living or taking care of family or having another job. Um, or dealing with an illness or anything else that's happening in your life, and there's always other things happening in our lives, you know, can can really be both an inspiration for art, but it can also be a factor in why we're not making it in the way that we want to. So really, what I'm hoping is, you know, that the book will help people kind of figure out ways that they can better fit it in to their lives, whatever their, you know, life realities may be. Do you believe that artists have a deeper, I would say a tougher skin, a, a harder core of resilience that they've had to develop over a lifetime of being an artist and truly trying to get their art into the world? I think that they have no choice. Um, you know, I mean, I think that so much about making art and about the creative process is challenging, you know, just whether it's learning the tools of the trade 
making the time to be able to do it, feeling, you know, that, you know, maybe you're, you're not that skilled at something and you need to kind of do it a lot to improve those skills. Um, you know, and then there's sort of the factor of where artists fit into society, because I think on the one hand, there's a lot of people who appreciate the arts, but I think they don't always appreciate all that goes into the arts. And so I think sometimes there is a feeling that either people are doing this and it's a nice thing they're doing, but it's not really how you make a living. I mean, think of how many artists might not have been supported by their families you know, in making a decision to say, oh, I want to, you know, pursue the arts as my primary career, um, because it is very hard um, to make a living. Um, so I think that, you know, and then when you make the art, um, a lot of times the art can feel like you're one with it. And I think that that can be both good, but bad, because when you face obstacles or criticism, um, you know, or people are not reacting to it in the way you would hope, um, it can feel like a personal, you know, like you feel it in your gut that, uh, you know, this is about me and people not accepting me as opposed to people maybe not accepting the art and kind of thinking of those things, uh, you know, distinguishing between those things. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's really interesting yeah. because artists really are one with their art form, I believe more so it's harder to go home at five o'clock and turn it off right you don't usually your art takes place after your five o'clock job but I know having lived 27 years in Manhattan in New York City and frequenting one particular restaurant directly across the street from Lincoln Center for many of those years I had the most fabulous birthday songs sung for me and where I got to witness for others by people who were performing later that night across the street at the Met or or were on their way to, or it was their night off from theater. Maybe Broadway was dark, but you know, those moments in time where you realize that art, it, you are your art, as I don't believe many people say I am my job, but if I am my art and my art is my job, then it's very hard to distinguish. And I think that can be very, very painful. And I totally understand families not supporting because they feel like, wait a minute, you're going to be starving. I mean, the term starving artist is, you know, didn't come out of nowhere. Um, but how nice for those who actually did gain support and also gain traction. What were some of the biggest ahas that you took away from the interviews that you did? I think the biggest aha was just, you know, how each person I talked to had their own story of how they got into the arts. I think, you know, for the majority of them, they all, you know, were very much like I've been doing this ever since I was a kid. I felt a calling for it. I have this deep motivation and love for doing it. Um, so I think that was the commonality between them. But then everyone's stories were different. There were people who ended up pursuing other careers and kind of kept their, you know, either they were in an adjacent career, maybe it was arts administration, maybe it was something else that used their creativity in another way, and then they did their art on the side. And there were people who, you know, purely pursued the art and had to be and continue to have to be very scrappy um, in how they do that. And I think that's why, I mean, I came across a lot of people who were, you know, almost what you would call multidisciplinary, you know, they weren't just doing one thing. And that was partially, I think, just because of their own creative temperament, but also because they were exploring different ways to, you know, not just make a living from this, but to really make a life from it. And I think that uh, curiosity is a big uh, part of being a creative and so sometimes you want to start exploring, you know, other forms of, of the creative process. And actually, that's one of the things I recommend is that if you're ever feeling stuck, that sometimes, you know, uh, one way to deal with that is try out an art form that isn't your own art form, where you don't owe it anything, you don't have any great expectations of it, but it's still letting your creative juices flow. Genius. And I think those are those are truths for all of us, because if we have avoided actually expressing our art, but we know it's in there, the opportunity is there for us to not have to own it, just try it, play with it, stay curious um, and stay interested. I know every photographer I know actually also 
paints and maybe plays music and and does a million other things because for those same reasons that you say, because they can. And I believe we all can. And so now you've got this book and we're excited to know more. And I know it's just releasing early in December, which is right in time with our release of this show. So Erica, where can we find Creative Resilience? Yes, it'll. it's going to be, it's being published by Bold Story Press um, and it will be available um, as an ebook. Um, I know on Amazon, the Kindle version, you can already pre-order and it will also be available in paperback. Um, and we're trying to get it into as many stores as possible. And if someone watching this doesn't see it at their store and they would like to, to get it, um, so just, you know, let us know and we'll, we'll let the publisher know and try to get it, get it there for them. Super. Well, I know our audience is always very excited about new books and and new art th- new art forms, and they are living into their most vital selves. So I know they're going to want to find it. Thank you so much for coming to share with us today, Erica Ginsburg. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure, and we'll be right back.